This is where we're really gearing up. We're hitting like the hard and heavy stuff. This is where like the rubber meets the road. We'll either see him kind of pull himself out of his nosedive, or we'll see him continue to second guess himself and falter. There's three football fields and the darkness when these dudes are going into a hostile situation to try and capture kill beyond jacked up. So, bad decision, and I got nailed on it. The Huey is a hot rod. It's pretty awesome. The stakes go significantly higher because we're shooting live ordnance now. That does weigh on me whenever I pull the trigger. Where are people out on the ground? They splash right on it. elite combat pilots in America arrive at the Marine Corps Weapons and Tactics Instructor course, known as WTI, they have the opportunity to prove their mettle, to demonstrate that they are the very best. So far, the pilots have made it through half of the four-week flight phase, and each is solidifying their reputation. As the heat begins to intensify, so will the missions they face. In the home stretch, there are only a few opportunities left to plant a flag and earn that coveted invitation to return as a WTI instructor. Throughout their time in Yuma, it can feel like the pilots are on a roller coaster. If they fail, it seems like rock bottom, but if they succeed, they're on top of the world. As the F-18 students return from their second large evolution, emotions are running high. We ended up being two circle with his F-5 and finally got the kill up high. Right now, F-18 students Spritz and Niedermeyer are feeling invincible. After landing an air-to-air -air kill on their latest test, for Niedermeyer, it's the rebound he needed after faltering out of the gate. When the doubts of my capability or my potential performance started to settle into mind, it really fueled me to perform better, to keep fighting through, and to keep working hard and show that I did indeed deserve to be here. We've hit the halfway point, and we got to push through the third and fourth quarter to come out victorious at the end of the game. After every evolution, pilots usually do a quick meeting to break down their performance ahead of the formal debrief. I wasn't sure why, I was like, am I, am I confused? Like, why are you hanging out down south? But, uh... but as the team huddles up today, mission leader Uncle is absent. After he was shot down in the exercise, Uncle questioned his place in the program and asked not to be filmed as he dealt with the moment at hand. Is Uncle Long's way out? Probably. I don't think so. <laughs> what other things from the brief do you have? I think it's kind of like the spare game plan, how we would run like a swap game plan if we needed it, who is the priorities to fly. So we talked about maintenance control, but that's about it. Everybody has good events and everybody has bad events. Some people respond to those individual events differently, right? And he, he was hot. I think that he just felt that it didn't go the way he planned it. And so I think he was beating himself up a little bit. And I think that he was holding himself to a high standard but I appreciate somebody that does hold themselves to a high standard, recognizes when they need their space, and it says, hey, I need to go internalize this for a little bit, think about what just happened, and I will come back tomorrow and be a more lethal asset to fight with and work with. Sweet, that's a wrap. All right. Top beers. <laughs> <laughs> WTI is a relentless gauntlet that can break even the best pilots in the country. The adversary division pushes the students to the absolute brink and boards the adversary commanding officer 
knows just how Uncle is feeling. You just feel like you can't do anything right because you're not told, hey, you did a great job on this, like your strike plan was awesome. You're just told what you messed up. And then you have to immediately pivot and go right into a new mission. And so it takes a huge amount of mental and emotional endurance to push through to the next event. Everyone has their own way of coping with disappointment. And for Uncle, that's always been a phone call to his father. And I kind of ran the whole like jet flows for this. My dad is kind of a huge role model in my life. He flew for the Navy, so I call him, I'll just give him kind of a debrief on the flight, and especially after something that bad. Uh, again, they gave me like the fighter lead for this one and just kind of punted it. It's usually, that's like how I get over it. We just kind of like decompress, talk about how things went. That I just had absolutely no idea what was going on. So yeah, it was uh, just kind of a mess, but he gets it. He's been through it. He's kind of seen it all, kind of being like, this same thing happened to me, you get past it. Yeah, ready, ready, to be, ready to be out of this place and get this over with, to be honest. This is where like the rubber meets the road. We will either see him kind of pull himself out of his nosedive or we'll, we'll see him continue to falter and kind of like second guess himself. And that's like really where we have to step in as instructors and be like, hey man, you're here for a reason. Anyway, so we'll see. But... I think he'll pull it out. I think he'll get there, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, thanks, much appreciated. Look Every day at WTI comes with its own challenges. Some days, it's just basic training and simulators. Others, it's the largest of evolutions, and the days just seem to bleed one into the next as the pilots receive their new missions, go through their pre-flight rituals, and then head back up into the air. And then, despite that grind, they must execute to perfection at all times. And because of that, emotions can flip on a dime. The UE students are finding out just how quickly things can turn. After executing the Department of State raid to perfection in week one, they were riding high, but today that's ancient history after a major misstep in their latest mission. He came like dip, plunging fire, and we were the first one. It was like in a row, like dude, just down the line. We were all absolutely <laughs> smoked, dude. We just saw him coming in. Like, he was like, yeah, we uh, just killed everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Huey students Chopper and Bush Hogg are trying to make sense of what just happened. During this latest mission, they were thrown a curveball when they arrived at the forward arming and refueling point surprised when they get there there's the SOCOM unit that they trained with during Department of State who walks up to them and lets them know that they have a mission that needs to be executed in two hours. For the extract like pretty much landed more or less the same spots. Uh, basically they dropped a mission on us to go insert these seals into a small town to go in and capture a high value individual. In this surprise mission, Bush Hogg was the lead Huey carrying the SEALs, while fellow Huey student Tinkle provided air cover. As the post-flight debrief begins, three members of the SEAL team are present, but their identities are obscured for their protection. So I landed probably 30 meters short, like did push right into the zone, and then two and three, I think we're a little bit far yep. behind me. So like, we didn't get you close enough to the building, and obviously like you can speak to it, but like that kind of screws up, so you guys are now split apart, and then you also have to travel farther, so. By putting the seals in the wrong place, or even putting them at the wrong angle to where they're intending to go, you can throw off their entire mission and prevent them from being able to execute with like the speed and violence that ultimately will make them successful. There's three football fields in the darkness when these dudes are going into a hostile situation to try and capture Carol Target. Like, unsatisfactory. Plus, did he say land to the east of the building in the middle of the desert? Is it off to the northeast? That's what they were expecting. And you put them in the wrong cardinal direction at three football fields away. The instructors don't mince words, leveling harsh criticism. 
and Bush Hog isn't the only one in the crosshairs. And Tinkle, why did you why did you hold him? Why did you hold Wolf? Tinkle delayed a rescue aircraft called a cherry picker from coming in. Major Kyle Olson, call sign Wolf, cannot believe Tinkle made the call he did. You stopped the cherry picker from coming in, grabbing the, the casualty, because you needed to relay an HLZ brief over to a fellow Deuce player, and you did that over a fire's net. I did. All right, like beyond jacked up. Kramer's being super polite about this, but dude, that is straight unsat. As the instructor Wolf levels this criticism, it may not be totally clear what he means. When he says unsat, it means unsatisfactory. And quite frankly, it's one of the worst critiques a pilot can receive. Tinkle didn't prioritize correctly on the mission, a call that could have cost lives in battle. Holding a Casavac platform because you have to give an LZ brief to another person inside your element? Bananas. Not not kosher, like absolutely unsat. So bad decision and I got nailed on it uh, pretty hard. It was a lesson learned and uh, it's one that I'll take, take forward definitely after this. The debrief at that heart of a level, especially when it becomes emotional, when mistakes would equate to death in real life or ourselves dying, it is important to make sure that they understand each one of those. Daytime flight was pretty good. Uh, nighttime flight had a lot of learning points. Um, but got some lessons learned, taken forward. So. For them, I would imagine it was the low point. Having been an instructor for six other WTIs, this historically is almost always the low point, and we design it that way. After this nighttime flight, both Tinkle and Bush Hog see their stocks drop. A clear step backward if they hope to distinguish themselves as the best. After a tough night, it's a new day and a new week in Yuma. It's week three of flight phase, and the students here are about to face their most challenging evolutions yet. But on the flight line, some things never change. Huey crew chief Danny Basin has been in the back of a Huey for the past 20 years, and there's nothing new about Danny's pre-flight checks. For most of that time, he's carried a good luck charm by his side, named Layla. So Layla's my dashboard hula girl up here. So there was an elementary school that sent care packages out to us on Iraq, and then some of the care packages had these little hula girls in them. So we just threw them on the dash of the Huey and flew around with them. And she's been flying ever since. So never home, leave home without her. She stays up here on the dashboard. I carry Velcro just in case the aircraft I'm flying in doesn't have it. So I can add it up there. I get uncomfortable when she's not with me. Even when things are going real bad. Look up there, Layla on the dashboard, and she's dancing around and smiling. You can't not smile. <laughs> Today, Layla better be ready to bounce around on the dashboard because it's time for the first major live fire mission that incorporates both the Hueys and the Cobra combat helicopters. The evolution is known as Assault Support Tactics 2, or AST-2. So, left gun, right gun, two rocket pods, and then you've got expendable. I'll take this gun. Yeah. Easier, yep. so, five. The stakes go significantly higher because we're shooting live ordnance now. When you have live rockets, live guns, live artillery, the complexity goes up a significant amount. Things are going in a lot of different spots. We were doing a simultaneous insert into two different objectives. So Ospreys were doing inserts, 53s were doing inserts. We are placing artillery batteries out there. Additionally, we've got artillery and mortars and the Little Birds are doing close air support. It's a really good exercise to integrate all of that. This moment provides a big opportunity for Huey and Cobra students to up their game in more complicated scenarios. For Huey student Chopper, 
It's a chance to build more momentum and distinguish himself from the pack. He's excelled of late, perhaps because he will not forget one JV mistake made at an earlier live fire event. Before the AST started, had an event basically employed the wrong weapon system off the aircraft. He shot a unguided rocket when he meant to shoot a guided rocket. I made a mistake. It was on me. I own it, and you know I just I deserved to down that flight. So 100%. Today, mistakes like that could have life or death consequences. Chopper is hell-bent on redemption, and he's not the only one. Huey students Storytime, Bushhog, and Tinkle are out to make everyone forget the brutal debrief they received after their last mission. to the north and inserted a team to a listening and observation post. Then the moment we lift, uh, we're now supporting them with our rockets and our guns. It was cool to land and then immediately transition into that close air support role. Tinkle and the Huey students support the ground troops using the impressive arsenal on board. And it's truly something to behold. The Huey is a hot rod. It's pretty awesome. The rotor head can just take a lot of Gs, which helps when you get in close to a target. can carry a bunch of different weapon systems, so 2.75 inch rockets for the forward firing ordnance with all kinds of different warheads, laser guided rockets, APKWS. On the right side we'll have the minigun. So the GAL-17 minigun shoots a 7.62 by 51 millimeter bullets at 3,000-ish rounds a minute, which is about 50 rounds a second. The impact it has on a target is awesome. And then on the left side, normally we'll have the GAL-21, which is a 50 caliber machine gun that shoots about 1,100 rounds a minute. What's your favorite? Minigun, for sure. Hands down. I mean, 50 cal guys can fight me for it. We can shoot in front of us, we can shoot behind us. So it gives us a lot of flexibility on where we can fly the aircraft to attack a target. So we'll stay as low as we can, uh, sometimes as low as 10 feet, and then pop up to a couple hundred feet, point the nose at the target, and then engage the target. Interacting first with gun. and then committing the nose to the ground to produce rockets on the target for more destructive and suppressive effect. And then pull off as low as possible. And then just kind of repeat that. And then being able to take two Hueys and then mutually support each other. by being able to provide fires when one is pulling off to the target and its survivability as well. It's a very delicate dance. It's a dance the Huey students relish the opportunity to perform and show what they can do. So far during AST2, all have had their chance, except for Chopper. I got constantly retasked to go do different stuff. I got tasked to go all the way out to this place to do a mission that I was told to go do, but it had already been covered, so it was almost like a waste of time. While Chopper itches to get into the action, only a few miles away, 
the Cobra team spins up and takes to the air to join the AST-2 evolution. Right away, Cobra student Spaz gets the chance that has eluded Chopper. I was just Dash 2. I was just there for the ride and to do whatever my lead aircraft wanted me to do. And we just went up north and basically facilitated an insert. And then we stayed on station and basically we're just providing fires for them. I got to shoot some missiles, so that's always a good time. So I thought that event went very well. Though Spaz is the type of pilot who prefers to be in the lead, in this mission, she's tasked with a backup role and makes the most of it. Fellow Cobra student Carmex was also scheduled to play backup today, but here at WTI, one thing is certain, you should always expect a curveball. I flew with Whipple and I was dashed to, to another student. Shortly thereafter, I got past the lead and I wasn't expecting it, so that was kind of a gut punch. People say, like, not my plan, not my problem. Well, here at WTI, it is your plan, regardless of whether or not you actually briefed it. Carmex is now the lead aircraft, and though he wasn't expecting it, he knows opportunities like this are huge. It's a moment to prove he is the elite of the elite. You can't sandbag. You can't just sit in the back and expect for things to go right. You have to actively participate, track what the hell's going on, and then execute properly. Executing properly means that Carmex has to decide when and if it's time to pull the trigger with live ammunition. These are judgment calls he takes very seriously and believes define him as a pilot. That does weigh on me whenever I pull the trigger. I have to look to see. Where are people at on the ground? Are there human beings on the ground? Okay, I know where they're at. I see the target. I am arming. Arm. All right, fire ready. And it's very, very deliberate for every single aspect prior to the missile coming off the aircraft. Splash right on it. The evolution goes to plan and is mostly uneventful. Always a good thing with live fire. Carmax makes the most of his unexpected lead role, leaving Spaz still looking for an opening to stand out. Meanwhile, across the base, the Huey students return and prepare for their post-flight debrief. <laughs> Hang out with us while we close up shop. Huey instructor Slot flew with the team today, and the crew earns high marks overall. But just a couple of pilots earn direct praise. Overall, uh, story time did a pretty good job today. His dash two was Bush Hog, and Bush uh, Bush did a pretty good job as well, stepping up when they needed to. For Huey student chopper. The frustration is mounting. During the mission, he had no moment to shine or make his mark. And now, to make matters worse, he has to hear Storytime's story about a record-breaking missile shot he landed. We know how far we hit an APK. How far? 8.2 clicks. Record. 8.1 was the original record. When Storytime tells Chopper that he hit an APK at 8.2 clicks, it's probably not totally clear what he means. Well, an APK is an advanced precision kill weapon system, one that usually has a range between one and five kilometers. Storytime hit his target from 8.2 clicks or 8.2 kilometers, an impressive distance to say the least. Uh, that was pretty cool. That's by far the furthest one I've ever shot. So yeah, it was pretty awesome. How many do you guys shoot? Two, one from 8.2, one from like five and a half. <laughs> so far, Chopper has been standing out amongst the UE students, but now 
Storytime has emerged as a real challenger in the race to prove who is best and earn that coveted invite back to be a WTI instructor. It will all come down to the fourth and final week for the Huey students. 8.2. As week three of WTI's flight phase draws to a close, the Huey students have a moment to catch their breath. But for the F-18s and Cobras, the time is now for perhaps the most unique evolution the course has to offer. It's called Anti-Air Warfare 3. For this evolution, the F-18s partner with the Cobras to attack targets defended by surface-to-air missiles, while F-35s provide air cover. But this time, there's a twist. They won't be facing a simulated foreign defense. Instead, they'll face American assets and American strategy. It means they must now assess our own equipment and find its weaknesses. As the old saying goes, Steel sharpens steel. Yeah, it should be a good one. Yeah. Hell yeah. So for AW3, the twist on it was that I was the red, and I was now the person trying to figure out how to tackle the problem. For our scenario, we had to strike four primary targets, embedded deep within enemy territory, and it was protected by this pretty robust surface-to-air missile infrastructure. I'm the mission commander. So I'm the one that had to decide how to get in there, strike those four targets, and then get out of there. And knock on wood, nobody's jets breaks, and we're, we're all in the place we need to be at the time we need to be there. <laughs> well, uh, it'll be interesting. <laughs> Lately, things have been a little too interesting for Uncle. He's coming off his worst performance yet, but after regrouping on a call with his dad, he's ready to turn the page. You're only as good as your last flight. There's kind of too much to focus on. You can't really dwell on stuff. I love that about flying. Like, it's one of my favorite things about this job is, uh, you know, kind of once you're strapped in and going, nothing else can affect you, and you kind of, you're like forced to just put it all out of your mind. I think that's kind of the key there. As Uncle and his fellow F-18 students prepare to go on the attack, they must be ready for one other new element in the operation, the integration of attack helicopters with them. That means flying alongside SPAS and the other Cobras. AW3 is the one time the Cobra shop really integrates with the jet guys. It's us trying to do a mission while also they're fighting an air war. And then it's building TAC air and building Cobras that go over to the red side where now the enemy attacking from the east and we plan it as such, trying to attack targets in the vicinity of Yuma real life kill removal, so we're taken out of the fight, you cycle out and you don't get to have any more effect and your day is over. Spaz here, uh, put together a plan that hopefully doesn't get us all killed. And uh, if she's successful in that, then I think we might come back with a win. Over the past few combat exercises, Cobra student Spaz has been tasked with backup roles, seeing Carmex get more chances to shine, but not this time. Today, She's the strike lead, and confident to say the least. We're gonna ideally win the war, and then we're gonna come home and tell Task Force Talon that they lost, and that'll be a good day. But we're gonna try not to get shot in the process. In this situation, we act as the adversary heir, so we're the bad guys, and we're trying to blow up their targets, and the good guys are trying to make sure that we can't do that. So you're trying to think through, what would I do if I was in their shoes, and they're doing the exact same thing. This is one of the main events that we have in the Cobra shop, so I want it to go well. But the only way that works is if we have a good relationship with the Jet guys, because if they're not above me, I'm gonna get shot down, because I'm pretty easy to get targeted. The thing that helicopters bring to the fight is they have a ton of ordnance, but they're slow. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> At WTI, pilots work in their own silos most of the time. So an exercise like this is a chance to assess those from other specialties. It can also be a chance to see an old friend, like for Spaz and Niedemeyer. 
I've known Gavin since college. We both went to the academy together. How high confidence are you about this until about your immobility of the vehicle? Very, very high. We got Great. <laughs> we actually were friends at the Naval Academy for all four years. We spent a lot of time studying and working together. He has not changed at all. He is still just this good-hearted, hard-working person, and it was really cool to see him here. I think that uh, we have a good plan. We've thought through this pretty thoroughly, and, and I think that there's multiple ways to win, so uh, I'm pretty happy about that. As the mission begins, the F-18s leave in separate waves. It's Harambe backing up and evaluating Uncle and Imes. After that, it's easy backing up and watching over Spritz and Niedemeyer. That's a solid game plan. There's an F-35 sweep that's going to attract some red air. And then after that, there is a four ship of F-18s that are going to go out and try and take down some of the surface air missile systems. Then everyone's going to come back and get refueled, rearmed, and launch back out. While that all happens, Spritz, Niedermeyer, and myself are going to man the station together with some helicopters. Maybe there's an opportunity where the enemy lets their guard down and we can just slip in, strike the targets, and get out. I was pretty impressed with Spritz putting himself in that position. It put him in a very good spot in the mission timing to be airborne when like critical decisions needed to be made, which is exactly what you want to see kind of out of a mission commander. In this crucial evolution, Spritz is making a case that he should be invited back as a WTI instructor when it's all said and done. But he shouldn't cash that check just yet. All will ratchet up another level on this exercise and as the last days of WTI unfold. This is where we're really gearing up and like we're hitting like the hard and heavy stuff. Either this is gonna go really well and that'll be good and it'll be the W that they need or it's gonna go really poorly and like now we're gonna have to start making large corrections to get them where they need to be. We'll see how we do. To establish yourself as a top combat pilot, it requires skill, confidence, and absolute calm to stay in the moment and execute no matter what happens. Throughout the course so far, each student has endured both highs and lows, been rattled and rebounded, but now is the time for them to make their final statement. Will Spritz and the F-18 students get the job done? Will Spaz plant a flag as mission leader of the Cobras? Before it's all said and done, one last evolution stands between the ball and that WTI patch. There's one last mission to make a mark as the very best of this year's class.